Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's event. Uh, it's a Appendix 4C results wrap. Uh, lots of Appendix 4Cs have been dropping over the last week or so, and I'm delighted to say we've got uh, two companies here presenting this morning. My name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Copy Microcaps. For anybody who is joining us for the first time, you're very welcome. And to all our regular listeners uh, and attendees, welcome back. Just a quick few intro slides and then we'll get into it. I just quickly do want to mention we've got a live conference uh, in person happening in Melbourne here tomorrow. I'm actually down in Melbourne for it. And there are still a few tickets uh, still available for tomorrow's event, which you can get from the Humanitics uh, ticketing platform. Uh, as always, I'd like to mention our virtual event sponsor here, Coffee Microcaps, DMX Asset Management. If you are looking for a micro cap or small cap fund manager, please do check out the DMX Asset Management website for all the relevant guides and application forms. Uh, compliance and disclaimer slide. Uh, for anyone who's joining us for the first time, the companies we normally have presenting on here are uh, capped under 300 million in revenue in the cash and the approach in cash flow break even or indeed would be already profitable. We generally don't have companies from the resources or biotech sector, what I like to call industry microcaps, which covers everything of the other sectors, financial services, healthcare, uh, consumer goods, professional services firms. Uh, structure this morning's webinar, as I said, we've got two presenters presenting over the next hour. Each company's got a 30-minute slot, which we'll roughly break down into a 20-minute prezzo, 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions for either of our presenters this morning, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function, and I will put them to our presenters at the Q&A session time. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel uh, later in the week. I can follow us pretty much on all the socials, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and I also write a free monthly newsletter that goes out on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, first up this morning, we've got a returning presenter, the Light Say Tomo Diagnostics with John Kelly, CEO, and Will Souter, the CFO. And then after that, we've also got another returning presenter, um, Abe Common. We're going to be joined by Executive Chairman Nick Lim. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to John and Will, who are patiently waiting in Sydney for us. I can see the, the Appendix 4C announcement now, John, so you and Will can take it away when you're ready. Very good. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Thanks, Mark. Um, we'll jump straight into the, to the cash and revenue position. So cash receipts from customers during the quarter of in excess of a million dollars, which was uh, mostly made up of HIV sales, the collection of HIV sales from the previous quarter and some sales related to OEM during the quarter as well. So that brings our total cash receipts year to date from customers to just under $3 million. Uh, revenue for the period continued to grow. We've had quarter on quarter growth. Um, obviously last year there was a lot of COVID revenue um, that dominated the, the P&L. And this year we've been able to, um, I guess, get back to the focus on HIV uh, and our, on our OEM business. So we've gone roughly half a million revenue in Q1, similar in Q2, 600,000 in uh, Q3, and we're anticipating that growth to continue Q on Q into Q4. Uh, in terms of the quality of revenue, I think that continues to improve uh, post COVID with uh, HIV growing across a number of customers and markets. And, and John will talk a little bit more about that. Um, and obviously with new products in the pipeline to be delivered in FY24, um, we can maximise those channels that we've opened up now across a number of different markets and a number of different geographies. And, you know, I think that quality of revenue and recurring revenue, as well as opening up across different markets, gives us an opportunity to um, have more of a portfolio approach, which improves our overall margin position as we move into 24. Uh, at the end of the quarter, we had $8.9 million of, of cash on hand and remained debt free. And in terms of our spend, we're maintaining a clear prioritisation on activities that are maximising opportunity for returns on our installed manufacturing uh, 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 asset base and also our intellectual asset portfolio. So what that means is uh, leveraging our existing uh, Galileo and Pascal platforms in particular that are already in market um, and taking those platforms 
into new markets and to new products. And, and John will talk some more about that. Obviously, with that comes a focus on a couple of key areas of spend, um, business development. So there's been a lot of activity across uh, Australia, UK, Europe, and the US in that regard, um, both for finished products and for our platforms. And also, obviously, to maintain and um, grow our portfolio, we need to continue to focus on regulatory activities and quality activities. So they've been the main areas of spend during the period. Um, very li limited uh, spend on capital because, as I say, we have that installed asset base and production uh, facilities ready to leverage. Um, and really, it's been a focus on business development and uh, product pipeline development. Yeah, and I think we've seen just on the financials uh, uh, reduction in the overall OPEX of the business, uh, about a million dollars of OPEX out uh, over the last year. And that's been to, I think, run as lean as we can and, as Will said, utilise the existing validated capacity that we have and, and focus on delivering new product opportunities as well as a restructuring of our go-to-market channel partners to really focus on the emerging consumer health market where traditional diagnostics companies have not been focused and don't have core expertise. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those channel partners and, and why we're excited about those. Uh, if we go initially to HIV self-test, we're, you know, we're, we're encouraged by the return to HIV within the public health sort of landscape. There was for a number of years, obviously, an overwhelming focus on everything COVID. And that was not only our customers and partners, but also public health providers in global health as well as developed countries and we saw as a result you know uh, a drop off in HIV interest over a period that's now I think returned to normal uh, and we're also very encouraged by the normalization of at-home testing uh, that's come about from the pandemic and that's made self-test particularly for HIV more of an option now for public health providers uh, prior to the pandemic, self-testing was not really, outside of global health, not really seen by public health as a, a, a preferred channel. And now we're seeing in the UK, in the US, and more recently with some positive discussions in Australia, uh, public health recognition of self-testing as a channel. And that's really encouraging for us in two, in two ways. One, because it diversifies the amount of public health channels that we can that we can push into. But more importantly, it's dealing with countries where we get better margins. So selling, obviously, products in Europe and, and in Australia uh, generates a significantly better per test revenue and per test margin than selling into, into global health. And we'll start to see not only, we think, significant step up in revenues, but also better, better gross margins associated with that. Uh, the first step in that restructuring was to move to a more consumer focused partner in Europe. Uh, we announced a initial order with Newfoundland Diagnostics who have pushed into retail channels through their COVID business and they're now expanding into a range of other testing applications and that shows the appetite in the UK in particular for consumer testing and they announced if you check their website out You'll see they announced a deal where they push into Tesco's, over 3,000 stores. Uh, they put a sizable order in for our HIV self-test, which we're yet to see in the revenue numbers. We expect to see that come through in the coming quarters. Uh, and that that's not only the UK, but Germany and a number of German-speaking markets as well. And they've got solid demand there. And I think that demand will only grow not only for HIV, but for other applications. And we're very mindful of the... Uh, ability for Atomo to bring quite cost effectively now other applications onto the platform. We have the regulatory approvals. We have the channel partners with access into retail. We have the validated facility in South Africa where we can make finished products quite cost effectively. Uh, and that was done to support global health, which is why we had to really focus on low cost of goods. But that now means that pushing into markets like Germany, the UK, uh, and Australia, New Zealand, and others, we get we get a, a healthy margin, and we expect to see our margins improve as we do that. Uh, outside of the HIV business, we are looking to bring a pregnancy blood test to market. That's a a very exciting opportunity for us. We submitted to TGA that dossier uh, a number of weeks back, 
that's based off a dossier that's already been approved uh, in Europe, the product C marked and sold in a number of countries by NG Biotech, and they're seeing solid growth in their uh, French business. And we're then reporting that through as a, re a new OEM business through NG Biotech as they build up their business in Europe. We went to App23 up in the Gold Coast, the largest pharmacy expo in the Southern Hemisphere uh, during the quarter. And we were uh, very, very encouraged by the interest from pharmacy chains and independent pharmacists. Uh, the blood-based pregnancy test that we're looking to commercialize here has two very significant benefits over urine rapid tests. And they are one, better early detection. Uh, HCG levels in blood build up quicker than they do in urine, uh, which gives a blood-based test a earlier detection window and better reliability in that first week of pregnancy. And secondly, blood could be used at any time. So if you go into uh, a pharmacy and buy a pregnancy test at lunchtime, you're advised that you cannot use it until the following morning with first flow. Uh, most women who are keen to understand their pregnancy status, don't want to wait an extra day, and using a blood test enables them to test immediately. Those two benefits are considered by the pharmacists that sell pregnancy tests to be material product advantages. Uh, and add to that, you know, the ease of use on the Atomo platform. We're very confident that that will be a sizable product opportunity for us uh, in Australia. And off the back of approval by TGA, we'll be looking to register in New Zealand. And we've already had uh, solid demand from a number of Asian markets as well. So that's a, a an interesting opportunity for us and one that we're looking to prioritize with revenues coming online, we hope early in the uh, FY24 period. We've also worked with a, a specialist consultant in the US to put together a pre-IDE submission package for FDA. We did secure the rights for North America with NG Biotech in that restructure, and we'll be looking to uh, move forward with an engagement with the FDA to finalize that plan with NG Biotech later this year. So we see pregnancy being uh, not only the next, a finished autumnal product to market, but a very sizable one that's playing into an established market. And we're coming into that market with a, a very uh, defined value proposition for the user, which we think is valuable and certainly the feedback from pharmacists would, would suggest that, that that is a product of potential uh, scale and opportunity. Beyond that, we've had from our channel partner discussions in the UK, as well as feedback from App23, a solid list of next products for us to prioritize on the platform. And we'll be looking to announce in the coming weeks, the product behind pregnancy. We're already well advanced on putting together that dossier and we'll be looking to complete some equivalency study testing in the next month or two and then submit later in the year for regulatory approval in both Australia and mm -hmm. Europe. And we would expect that product to be approved and in market by the end of calendar year, F, sorry, financial year FY24. So we'll not only be seeing a, a buildup of HIV revenues over the year, but also the introduction of pregnancy tests and other tests through this financial year. And that will, we believe, show ongoing quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth. And it's important to note that that doesn't require a lot of additional investment from Atomo. We have the platform, we have the validated manufacturing, we have the certified facility, and we now have the channel partners waiting for product. And I think that allows us to bring a number of products to market in the next 12 to 18 months with, with a, a very modest uh, investment from the business now to get those products to market. We also announced in the period the granting of a number of, we believe, valuable patents in key healthcare markets, uh, primarily US and China. The IP that underpins our technology is fundamental to the value of the business and the ability for Atomo to become a market leader in consumer testing. We have unique usability that, that the regulators recognize that consumers really value not only in terms of the ease of use, but also the reliability. That's now been proven in a number of independent studies. And those studies are showing uh, that our device gets regulatory approvals in markets where bits and box formats struggle. And this IP now being granted uh, off the back of a number of 
first line patents uh, gives us a defendable proprietary position that allows us to generate a unique position in the market that we can get a premium for, as well as obviously uh, a list of OEM customers interested in accessing that platform. Very encouraged to see our existing OEM customers back ordering product. We did have a, a hiatus on our OEM business through the COVID pandemic when all of our partners and pipeline partners were focused on COVID solutions. Now that COVID has essentially fallen away from the diagnostic market as a priority product, we're seeing NG Biotech reordering at a rate above the orders we were seeing before the pandemic. And they're very bullish about the opportunities for further orders. We're seeing a new pipeline of opportunities coming through our business development discussions in the US. So that OEM business, I think, albeit being behind schedule because of COVID is continuing to grow. And again, we have that validated capacity online that is ready to fulfill that demand. So we don't need to really spend any more CapEx to get there. <clears throat> so where that leaves us moving into the final quarter, I think is recognizing that the COVID revenues that we saw, like a lot of companies has fallen away. Uh, we have restructured the channel partner arrangements that we have to move away from diagnostic company partners to consumer health companies, both retail and online. Uh, that's where the growth is in self-test markets. That's where our technologies and products add the most value. And that's where we have a defendable patent position that we can leverage off. We're starting to see now interest from companies like Newfoundland and others for accessing our HIV product. They've already put a short list of other op opportunities on the table. Uh, we have had similar lists provided by local pharmacy partners here at the, at the conference. So I think we're now looking to execute on that, bring pregnancy to market and a number of tests behind that. And we have the capacity now to supply into that and we're ready to, to start to grow beyond COVID. I think just to emphasize that point, um, because it's something we've been talking about for some time, but we're really starting to see it in practice now. And I think the Newfoundland order is the first really, really good tangible example of that shift. Um, conversations we were having previously with customers, as John said, were diagnostic customers, and they were trying to figure out how to get out of the lab and how to get into the hands of the consumers. These potential customers and existing customers like Newfoundland are coming at it from the other direction. They're coming at it from the consumer's direction. They're coming at it from an FMCG kind of background. And they're coming at it from a, you know, go to market and partner with Tesco's and Coles and, and Boots and so on. And that is a totally different approach and one that fits, you know, tremendously well with what Otomo is offering. So I think that shift in the landscape that's, you know, being brought about by COVID, those guys opened up all those channels through COVID is now really starting to to um, to play out in practice and we think that's just the first example of how we're going to be able to to leverage that shift and leverage that i guess different approach to to the market that these guys take as compared with the traditional diagnostics company so that's really really encouraging and gives us um i think an opportunity to generate that really quality revenue that we've been talking about recurring revenue into bigger markets um, you know, different markets with higher margins and also a diversification of the product portfolio. Um, you know, if, if we find ourselves in a position where we've got UK, Europe, we've got Australia, we've got North America opened up and it's all underpinned by global health business and OEM, then that's what we're, you know, that's what we're pushing towards and that's what we're targeting. And I think we're just starting to see the, the real first tangible steps of that um, through the last quarter. Yeah, and I think while we wait for that revenue to build up and those products to come to market, you know, we're mindful of the cash on hand position that we have. We've worked really hard to pull OPEX cost out of the business about a million dollars uh, over the year. And we'll continue to run as lean as we can. Our headcount has, has contracted a little bit as we try to do more with what we've got. And that's to ensure that we've got the capital on hand to deliver these new products to market and start to deliver a range of products into these consumer health channel partnerships that we're now looking to to firm up and, and scale. Yeah, and we've had we've had some questions about that cost base and what does that look like in terms of you know the executive pay, the the overall cost base of the business. And I think you know the point to emphasize is there's a there's a line that needs to be taken during a period like this in the market which is to to be careful with your capital and be sensible with it but also to continue to invest and that's what we've been doing um 
And in order to do that, you know, there is a core, um, a core cost base to any business and a core cost base to any ASX listed business that needs to be sustained. So I think um, we've, we've been very, very careful and very, you know, judicious with our capital. Um, but as John said, every, every expenditure decision that we're making, we're thinking about how that plays into the business's overall strategy and how it plays into, you know, current market conditions. And the good thing is that we've, you know, we've used shareholders' funds uh, from the IPO to build out that production capacity so that we are now in a position to leverage that. And really now it's about spending on that core business development, the core regulatory and quality activities, uh, and, you know, the, the, the core um, quality, I guess, team support for all of that, for all that activity. So that means having engineers that can onboard products. It means having, um, you know, a, a team that can deal with regulators in Australia and WHO, you know, in the US. Uh, it means having, you know, individuals in our different markets that can talk to customers. And, and that's, you know, that's really the core of the business that we've got in place right now. Um, and I think that's what's required to deliver on the growth that we're talking about. Yeah. So, Mark, happy to uh, to take some questions from anyone that wants to put them. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, William. I mean, we had one question there, as you say, on, um, yeah, I guess profitability and executive pay. But I think uh, you guys have in your remarks there have, have kind of covered it off. I just wanted to to delve a bit deeper into the, the TGA approval for the, the pregnancy test in terms of, you know, what is a kind of a timeline uh, of steps that happens? Let's say, you know, TGA email back tomorrow or, you know, you get some notification back tomorrow that's uh, approved. You know, what are the steps that then has to follow so that, you know, if somebody goes to, I don't know, chemist warehouse, uh, you know, the, your product is going to be on the shelf there beside a traditional, you know, a clear blue one so that they can actually have the option to buy it and, you know, kind of, roughly how long that would that that kind of process would take before you know we kind of really start seeing you know um stocking orders or first orders coming through and obviously revenues coming through from it i just want to kind of get a, a bit of a deeper sense of how that would go yeah no that's a great question so i mean obviously the the, the largest variable there is is how quickly the tga you know responses back and how much time then it's required to close that process out. Assuming that that is smooth, uh, we would be hopeful of, you know, initial sales potentially in that first quarter of FY24. Certainly off the back of App23, we're talking to uh, distribution channel partners in Australia and New Zealand. We've also had inbound inquiries from a number of markets in Asia, which we believe we can get, you know, fast track approval once we have the TGA approval. Uh, the time to get product in country pretty quick because NG is already making their version uh, on an ongoing regular basis. So swapping out the branding and packing to the Atomo versions already sort of set up. So, you know, once we get approval, we could have product in country, you know, within a matter of weeks. We're talking to channel partners in advance of the approval. The idea is that we have those agreements either executed prior to approval or ready to go you know with approval maybe being a a sort of uh requirement to execute on the final deal but having that partner lined up which means then that the go to market time on the other side is relatively you know pr prompt so you know we certainly would would be looking and hoping to be selling product in australia this side of Christmas, potentially, you know, not that far into the new FY. And I guess just to add, we're already selling HIV tests into pharmacies. So we have a network of pharmacies that are already Atomo customers. Um, so we'll be able to go to them. Obviously, they'll be our first port of call and, and ones we can get into quite quickly. And then secondly, we you know, we, we announced that we, we're selling through API as well. So we, we would expect to be able to put, you know, some stock through them reasonably quickly as well. So as John said, it's about, you know, getting through the TGA uh, getting the product in country and once that happens then you know we'll, we'll be we'll be up and running and we'll be able to move fairly quickly to at least hit that first batch of of you know existing customers and expand that out from there and then just an extension on that and you know the the kind of asian expansion as the you know let's say the the the, the second order of that can you directly leverage the tga approval or the c mark approval in asia or is there like another 
in-country regulatory approval that needs to you know process that needs needs to happen if you if you were to move it into asia yeah it, de it depends on 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 the territory mark normally the export certificate can in some countries facilitate a, a straightforward registration where you normally need an in-country partner to be sort of the product sponsor to register it but it doesn't necessarily require any additional clinical evaluation there are some countries that want to receive a batch of product and do some basic testing to prove efficacy before they'll approve it but that's normally quite quick i mean the thing to remember here is that in most territories a pregnancy test is a class two uh, we've obviously been working to a higher standard with HIV being a class four in those types of products. Countries normally do want to do some independent evaluation, albeit, you know, a, a sort of summary version. But we don't believe for pregnancy that there's an extensive in-country requalification requirement. So we think the the time and effort and cost to get follow on Asian, Asian registrations off the back of TGA is pretty, pretty quick. Yeah, great. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, expanding the the sale sales in Europe, is is that more about just getting the, the pharmacy partners on board, or is it getting different OEMs, channel partners for for different markets? Like, can NG Biotech, you know, expand into other countries for you with um, you know, their set up it's just finding the the, the in-country pharmacy partners or is it a case of you know looking for specific um channel a, a specific channel partner like ogm specifically for the spanish market and and then it's they got to find a pharmacy partner for you yeah so uh, with in in the pregnancy market ng have access to europe under the agreement so they are they're launched in france they're launching or have launched very recently in the uk they have a distributor in Germany that covers the German speaking territories and they're looking to expand outside of those markets, particularly in Eastern Europe over time later in the year, I understand. They've also placed a first order for Brazil. They got Brazilian approval and we're hoping for a second order for Brazil soon. So they're, 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 you know, they're growing in their markets and then we decided to divide and conquer. So we took over you know, Australia, ANZ, specific potential opportunities in Asia as well as North America. So I think by spreading our go-to-market resources uh, across both businesses, we're able to get into more countries quicker than we would if we just let NG try and do it all organically. Uh, outside of pregnancy, obviously we're in discussions with Newfoundland around you know opportunities beyond that first order. We're very excited by them having a channel into Tesco's. We know that Tesco's are interested in a range of different test applications, a number of which are suitable on our platform. So we'll be looking to expand, you know, the offering that we bring to Europe. Uh, and certainly, you know, the next product that we announce shortly will be not only an Australian focused submission, but also uh, an IVDR submission into Europe for a European uh, consumer market that's really growing quite rapidly across a whole range of different applications, not just HIV. And uh, just one final question, then, John. I don't want to keep on the pregnancy one, but it is a larger opportunity set than than the HIV one. Um, is there an education piece that hap has to happen for the consumer where you know they get the benefits, uh, or they're aware of the benefits of, uh, you know, the 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 blood based one versus the urine based one? Because you know that you know kind of clear blue. One, I know I, I'm going back to it, but, you know, it's been in market for so long and it's kind of, you know, for a lot of people, it's probably like a default setting for them. And it's how you educate them to say, you know, there is actually a, a better option here at a, let's say, a cost competitive price, I'm assuming. You know, is there an education piece that, that has to happen that's either funded by you or, you know, funded by NG Biotech or, you know, training a pharmacy staff or, or, or training a, the pharmacist themselves so that, you know, when somebody is looking for an option there, you know, guiding them more in, in your direction rather than, you know, a, a product that's, you know, got a got a long history in market? Yeah, so this is a great question. There's a couple of bits to the answer. I think what the first point I'd make is, you know, there is an education requirement, but at the same time, people intuitively seem to understand that 
that blood is better than other sample types for diagnostic accuracy. So we've done a few survey focus groups and we asked the question, is a urine sample more accurate than a blood sample for detecting pregnancy? And not very many people put their hand up for urine. So I think, and we've had similar things with uh, the Atomo HIV test versus the oral uh, swab test. People don't trust oral fluid or, or urine the same way they trust blood. And we quite often get feedback, you know, when I go to the doctor, he, he takes blood for tests. He doesn't, you know, use urine or, or, or swab cheek samples. So I think people intuitively know that blood is the most reliable sample type for a lot of these types of tests. That said, you're right. Blood's not a typical pregnancy test sample type. And there needs to be obviously uh, an education program at the pharmacy. So that when people come in asking for pregnancy tests, people know that the blood test first is available and B that it's potentially more accurate if you think you're just pregnant or if you want to get a result immediately, you know, pharmacists do know and have already been told that urine tests are more accurate first flow, which means that, you know, if you go in and buy one at lunchtime, you really shouldn't use it. And we actually got told the reason that pregnancy tests are sold in packets of two quite often is because Someone will buy it on their lunch break, take the test, and if it's negative, retake the test the following morning because they've been told that the afternoon test isn't as accurate. With, with our device, it is. You only need one test, and, and it's going to be more accurate than either of the urine tests in that early phase. So I think once that education is 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 out there, the channel, we believe, is, is ripe for disruption. But yes, we need someone that can help us get that message out, and I think a go-to-market partner that has access into the pharmacy network will be really helpful in getting that that knowledge up quicker than potentially we could do it organically with one or two people. So I think we're looking and open to finding a partner that sees that opportunity that can really help us get into pharmacies at scale and get that, that educational piece quickly quantified. But once you do hear that, people accept it and understand it. And it seems intuitive that blood is more accurate. And, you know, that's really encouraging that people aren't questioning why could it, how could it be a week earlier? People are saying, yeah, I get that. We've also got that infrastructure in place to support online training and do it sort of reasonably, reasonably efficiently, Mark, because we needed to do that for the HIV self-test as well. So, um, so there's a sort of a pathway there that we can follow um, to a greater or lesser extent. I think, as John says, with pregnancy, it's a bit easier for people to get their head around quite quickly. Whereas there were there were no HIV self tests in the market when we first came to the market here in Australia, so we were starting from from scratch there. But pharmacists have taken that up pretty enthusiastically over the last you know nine months since we got the TGA approval to approach pharmacy. So you would think pregnancy would be um, similar, if not easier. Yeah, and and I think you hit you know an important point. HIV is more of a niche market. We have a monopoly here in terms of being the only product to market, but it is a a, a limited market size i think the pregnancy market obviously significantly larger several million tests uh, each year in australia you know we think there's there's significant growth opportunities in that channel okay guys we'll have to leave it there because we're gone slightly over time and i do know our next presenter nick lim is uh, from acom and is waiting very very patiently for us uh, on the side here so thanks john thanks will and um nick uh, if you want to start sharing your presentation, I'll let you know when I can see it coming through on screen. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, Nick. Morning. It's coming up now. Yeah, I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Nick. Uh, you can you can take it away. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Hey, comment I missed it about uh, 2014, August. So it's been an interesting journey for us. We found it very rewarding. Uh, and eventually, over the years, we've focused on being a fintech business doing financial transaction management. We do expense management for, um, and we've also started a payments business in part euro. And we're absolutely focused on blue chip clients, which are just government and very large corporates. And in the last eight, nine years, we have built a business in being focused on either being a leading player in what we do, which is in the expense management space. Our largest competitor is SAP Concur. And we have been able to make our marks 
in the business. Uh, very diligently, we've built ourselves to ensure that we are best in class, very focused, very intentional, how we build this business. And in very simple terms, what Expense Aid does is we help process uh, primarily the credit card, corporate credit card transactions of our clients. So if an employee at Woolworths or Rubber Bank, Mitre 10, or Department of Premier, Premier and Cabinet in New South Wales or Prime Minister and Cabinet in federal government swipes their corporate credit card for a transaction, be it an Uber ride or a, a plane ticket or a hotel stay, that transaction comes into our system within 24 hours. And then we help process and put that transaction into the financial accounting systems uh, of the organizations. And for that, we charge them a fixed fee, uh, which is uh, up to about 50 cents per transaction. And of course, they pay us a baseline fee on a monthly basis as well. So that business, when we first bought it, uh, was doing about 30,000 a year, uh, 30,000 a month in, in uh, revenue success. We've grown that about 10 times now. And we've also grown the, the user base uh, very significantly. For the card hero business, we started this business about a year and a half ago at launch. And about two, uh, a year before that, we received our first mandate from Pipe Without Barriers. And what the card does is that leveraging the EML platform, we issue a MasterCard that allows uh, the NDIS participants to receive their funds on a card hero card. So once again, very focused, but here, instead of uh, being in a business which is quite mature, we went into a pioneering position. We developed this product uh, when we realized with Life Without Barriers as, as really a client and a partner, that there wasn't a solution in this space. And the size of it was very, uh, uh, it, was very it was a large size of transactions that was going through the system. So we went with that. Uh, I'll talk more about it further on. But essentially, we have, over the past year and a half, built out uh, a very strong product. We've seen a lot of recognition from large organizations with dispersed funds on our behalf of government or uh, in large space. And um, I'll talk through it a little bit more. I'll just step through our financial highlights. Uh, in the last quarter, we did a million and a half in revenue. Um, I think the key highlight for us is that we're really in this transition to becoming operating cash flow positive. The, the business has hit a point where the, there is that maturity of the recurring business, but also because of the soft order book with our federal government mandate, we are, we are just seeing very strong uh, take up in terms of our products and our offerings. So I'll just step through these numbers here. We have 39% growth um, PCP in terms of revenue. Uh, just as a reference point, we've actually surpassed last year's revenue of 4.5 million, so we have 4.6 million as of the first three quarters of the year. Um, year to date, our value of transactions is a type of fair with expense, expense aid is at a, a, a run rate of about a billion dollars for the year. So every month we're transacting about eight dollars uh, of transaction history. That is also at a very strong level of maturity. Yeah. Next thing is that the TCB for the year signed about $5.5 million of deals. And in combination, that TCB is uh, 5.5 is greater than the combined FY21 and 22. As a reference, uh, the GovRP mandate that we received was one in about July, August in 2021. So fast forward about 20 months, 20, 22 months, we have really found our momentum in how we engage with the federal government agencies. The primary agency in, in uh, GovRP is Services Australia. And we have had a, a good collaborative relationship, or we've rather we've built a good collaborative relationship with uh, Services Australia to ensure that we support them. And they also help promote us as an offering within GovRP. I'll talk more and uh, more detail about GovRP in the slides moving forward. The 
they're sticking on with the numbers. Um, you know, obviously, when you invest in a software SaaS business, software service business, you're mostly interested in what that SaaS revenue looks like because it was highly recurring on a transactional means. And we've got a nice 25% uh, year on year increase in SaaS revenue. So we're closing on about 900 grand, about 300 grand average a month. Uh, so about 900 grand for the quarter. And historically, the Q3 is our weakest quarter because our business is governed by the most number of working days in a business. When we look at most number of working days in the business, it is um, the December, January, February usage quarter, which is what we build uh, during the January, February, March quarter. We build we'll one month in arrears. It's the weakest number of working days, and even then, we still have a three to two six hundred. Uh, touching on to the forty-seven dollars, your VRP ARPU is significantly higher than our average ARPU. So what your VRP pays for a federal government agency pays because they use essentially the, the fullest set of our offerings. They use the most features and functions of our product uh, suite. So they pay a higher fee. They get a lot more value out of it than as compared to let's say Uber's or let's say non treasury government. New South Wales government is part of our thirteen dollar um, trailing twelve months revenue, which is a good sense of where we're going to, what where we are, where we're moving. Very strong revenue growth against the previous year. PPM is continuing. Cash balance is one point seven million. There's there's no need for capital raise for us uh, as we transition to doing our project. Cash revenue, we obviously had a bump in around the uh, FY late 2020, FY21 period uh, due to COVID. But I think the recovery there is in tandem with a lot of things uh, around travel and the, uh, the world of this activity, business activity. Um, our business is predicated on that. And of course, we've also added a lot of new customers as well. So we see, we've seen a healthy increase in movement into our pool and getting to a point. Um, I think the GovRP mandate will significantly grow the FY24 number, and that's also going to be the one that's the basis to getting us to cash positive. The reason and give a picture of it here, it is that not only that is their hard pool a lot higher at around the $47 mark, as opposed to the average of about 20 the 5.5 million PPV that we have, have won in the last financial year. We've rolled on a lot of new clients, but there is a lot more that comes through. And in this current quarter that we're in now, quarter four, we're also doing a lot of go lives. You can see a lot of uh, new users coming on the system. Uh, we had a decrease. Uh, it was a little bit disappointing for us. Uh, we lost a client of ours, uh, transport for New South Wales. Uh, there was very high volume uh, with a net decrease in, in monthly revenues, about 20,000. It didn't affect the numbers that much in general because we were offset by new clients uh, on board over the quarter. But uh, something for us to be cognizant of. We have historically had a very low churn rate. Are we alarmed by it? We're not alarmed by it. It was disappointing to lose it. Uh, we understand the process that led to it. It wasn't about our product or offering, etc. Uh, but it's the nature of so how some organizations want to organize themselves. We still, we're, we don't think that it's one of those um, heights that are going to come through. As in, you know, lots of different changes. Um, interestingly, with new New South Wales government, uh, our mandate is probably covering about 80% of the total time base, the user base in New South Wales government. We just had a renewal from the uh, Department of Education as well, which is our single largest uh, user based base. So we're going to watch it and of course take heed to what happened, take it seriously. But nonetheless, we, we know that we, we have an engaging model with our clients, of course, the existing and the new ones. Um, and we've, we've done our kind of reflection. We've also got to move forward.
Fed Gov uh, are full at uh, specifically forty six ninety six or forty seven dollars close to it. Uh, is trending to where we think it will rest. It probably rest at like a fifty or dollar mark. Uh, that's what we expect. Continue to see that. Uh, we can see a recovery of the, the user numbers. But I think the blended R pool of the 2012 is definitely going to go up, pulled up by the set So, just a bit of a, a sense uh, of those who are less familiar with uh, our federal government ERP mandate. The essentially in Fed Gulf, they have entities, and uh, the number of entities changes. What's important for us is those which are mandated and which are optional. So out of the 19 mandated government agencies, which are mandated on the ERP, 28 are currently existing or live. And we generally charge, uh, in most cases, we encourage them to do a phase zero, fee, uh, phase zero process, whereby we assess the readiness and preparedness for the organization to take on board our uh, modules with the ERP. And that's a paid engagement. It's generally about $40,000 per engagement, and about depending on the size and the number of agencies. Um, our implementation fee on a technical basis or technical dimension is about $50,000 and above. Generally, what you'll see is like uh, really with the mandate we announced with uh, Veteran Affairs, which is, uh, which is a subset of uh, within the Department of Defense. You'll see much larger. Uh, Implementation fees they go up to like 400,000, 500,000. That's because there's a lot of change management involved. So we have to deliver a change management capability um, as part of the process. And when that happens, uh, it requires us to also bring in third party providers or experts in helping to deliver change management. The number of users we anticipate. So right now we've got about 1,000 uh, live users compared to and the maximum number is about 161 as it changes on a daily basis. But we expect the minimum to be about 110. So the delta we're looking at is 110 minus 21,000 that we have. We have ways to go, uh, 70, 80 over grand. Um, and if you calculate, you multiply it by 47, how to you be very clearly show that it is a very sizable business. Um, and you're well on our way to realizing this soft order. So where are we on this order book? We, we, as you can see here on this, uh, this kind of chart here, we've got 23,000 live users. Um, well, let's start from the left. So there's 75,000 users within the department whom we have not had a formal engagement to begin phase zero. So whilst we have been exposed to these uh, potential clients and departments and entities, they have not indicated to us and said, hey, we need to do a phase zero and we, have, we need to find a slot for you guys to come in to engage with us uh, and do this pay. So that's 75,000. 36,000 have either paid for us to complete, to do the phase zero. They've either booked in at time or they've done it, but they haven't signed the agreement to be onboarded. Uh, or they are planning uh, that they're, they're planning their schedule in terms of the logic of ERP and trying to figure out time slots to set them. On the onboarding front with the 27 counts, that is also a mix. There is whereby there's some who are who've already signed and begun onboarding process, uh, implementation, etc. And there's some who have indicated that they want to, but they still haven't found it. Also, they want to onboard, but they haven't figured out when they should do it. So they, we haven't signed that final documentation yet. We had to find a way to uh, give a sense for ourselves internally and uh, for, for the investors as well, to give a sense of where things sit. Um, and for now, this is the best way that we can represent it. And so the key agencies uh, recently that have designed, uh, that have come on board, so it's a veteran affairs, veteran affairs is actually within defense. Uh, they're quite independent. Uh, so definitely a good reference point for us. 
ASIC uh, signed on recently as well, and DQ and Change is a fairly new department of finance and six other uh, departments which consume the shared services um, offering in finance and also human services. I'll talk to Card Hero now. Um, essentially, it's a prepaid card product that helps disperse funds. The beauty of it is that it allows you to have real-time capabilities in terms of seeing the transactions coming through and that Helps you gate the merchants as well. But more importantly, what really happened? So in a nutshell, in a long-standing client of ours, Life Without Barrier, we've been a client now for about 10 and a half years, came to us and said, look, we would like you to help us design a solution for the NDIS funds that come through our system. And we developed the system, they've gone live now, and essentially what we do is we receive the NDIS funding uh, for NDIS participants who use Life Without Barriers and also web payment now, so I said, fine, who are using it. And then the funds are coming come onto our Card Hero cards, and they use the Card Hero cards as a form of payment. And what this replaces is a historical Westpac uh, card, uh, ATM card. So they used to just have, well, they still run the current system now, but they're on they're, they're moving people across. And the Westpac card is an ATM card that is also uh, issued to carers to make purchases and transactions on behalf of a person with a disability. So what we've done is that it allows for far more visibility, uh, pre-approval, a lot more transparency, and ultimately it maximizes the hour of care from the carers because they don't, they no longer have to do very arduous manual type reporting for the transactions. So we are starting to see the numbers in part here starting to get meaningful things. Uh, certainly by, we expect that by year end this year, we should have be at about a half a million a year our pool and rate for part here. The rollout plan uh, has had some changes and now we can see a lot of visibility now with regards to whether it's just haven or life without barriers as well. The interesting thing that's happened is that for what Haven they've expanded the use of our cards to also they replace all their employee cards, uh, public credit cards with card hero cards. And West Haven has also implemented our cards for their new chat payments. Uh, I know we've got Q and A. Uh, should we kick that off, Mark? Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, unless there's you know one or two key points you want to call out on these last few slides, uh, Nick. Yeah, I think uh, three key points. One is that we've got a we're in a very fortunate position where we've got a very strong uh, soft order book mandate slash pipeline that will within within reason get us through to. Uh, Get us to cash positive profitability, etc. Two is we certainly don't need a capital raise. There's no requirement for that. Uh, we can see over the last quarters we've really brought down the, the cash burn. Um, and I think we're going to see be on the other side of that equation quite soon. Um, and finally, we we are in this thing whereby we've got a strong business that is in a leadership position, and we've got a new business in Card Hero that we are very confident of is going to hit the mark. It's, it's a pioneering product, but it's developed itself, uh, it's well positioned, uh, whereby it's leveraging a very strong uh, brand that we have in our core, in our original business. And I think it's, it's gone with the attention of, uh, of exactly where we want to be. So blue chip uh, and basically large East Coast markets. Okay, we've got a couple of questions, Nick, so we'll, let's just tackle these uh, as they've come in. Uh, the first one is on the Transport for New South Wales contract roll-off. Um, the question is, did, did they go to a competitor? Um, yes, they went to SAP. Okay, the first. And are there much similar low ARPU accounts that we should be expect rolling off in the near future? We don't see an indication of it. Uh, obviously, obviously, if it's government or even with, with corporate clients as well, 
because expense management is something not something that they change very often. When they do, there's generally a formal process. So formal process meaning that it's either going to be a tender, RFP, etc. And of course, the incumbent generally has a sense of what's happening as well. Also, well, what happens with these large mandates is that, or, or within the expense management world, the roll off and the bring on can take quite a while. So we have got quite a lot of visibility, and right now it's just there's, there's nothing else that you can see on the horizon. Okay, and then the next one is uh, there's a few parts to it, so we will just break it down here. Uh, this quarter, capitalized IP development is cost is zero. Um, should we expect this to continue? Is let's say take that as the first part. Yeah, that pretty much is going to be the same thing. With the, the build is done, and uh, there's now BD work a lot, a lot of BD work for copyrights. Okay, and then are the latest investments in cybersecurity and infrastructure a permanent OPEX step up or more product related ex uh, expenses? So the the two parts of the question. One is that certainly there is a elevation of what we spend on in terms of security, etc. And that's not going to change. There's going to be a need for it. But there are a lot of things which are quite project based. Um, so on the first part, there's security spend that is cyclical in nature. What I mean is that we'll have you know, requirements for PCI compliance, uh, IREP compliance, etc. Uh, but then there are other things that which are one of strengthening. The good thing is that when we're doing the infrastructure stuff and as we're, we're scaling up in our size, we're getting the commensurate discounts from it as well. So some of the spend gets will be offset by savings in the future. So should we expect FY for OPEX to follow the 23 uh, exit run rate? Uh, there is an OPEX which is uh, linked to implementations. So that part goes up and down, but in the, the general baseline OPEX, yeah, we see that we, there'll be a slight increase, I think, because we are preparing for a little bit more headcount coming on, uh, just given the, the sheer number of uh, clients going on. We have to run a ratio of number of support versus uh, the clients as well. Okay. And then live users on the GovERP program have only increased by 2,000 over the last six months. Is there a bottleneck, you know, stopping the onboarding or, or transitioning of live users? Yeah, so generally organizations like to bring on live users in, in consideration of half year and full year accounting periods. That's their preference. So they like to go sometimes just before June 30th or just after. And then just before December or just after uh, January, that's a preference there. So we are going to see a pretty decent web coming on for pre June 30th. But there will also be some that, that will to the next period. So that's just how it's set up because we are so linked as a product to the ERP, the accounting system. And then uh, just one for me, you know, you talked about the government uh, contracts, especially, you know, they like to take the you know all of the options the kind of full stack do they normally take that from day one or is it something they kind of like build up over time so you know all the deals you've done you called it out in your presentation you know total contract signed this year is more than 21 and i think 22 combined but you know when these people go live are they going live with you know taking all the taking all the options available or are they just kind of taking you know the the bare basics and you would expect them to add on extra modules or, or, or pay for different features, you know, 12, 24 months from, from the time they go live? Yeah, so generally they will take on everything at once. The ones who do the incremental stuff are the existing clients. We then have to do the change management to bring on the incremental stuff. Those who are new, generally take everything on because that is the, uh, it's either a mandated or the, the kind of Gavi or spec. So when they do that, they try and get that spec. The interesting thing when you, when you sell to government is it's unlike corporate. In corporate, it's one organization, another organization, they don't talk to each other about kind of best practices or what they do. In government, they are actually our biggest ambassadors because they will demonstrate it to all the other departments that they speak to or they have an engagement with. So, and people want to see, people want what someone else wants, uh, especially when it works, when it comes through as a, 
and something that works well. So. Okay. Well, speaking of marketing, that's um, let's tackle this as our last question. Uh, yeah. The appointment of Deloitte as an implementation partner, does this include Deloitte marketing the expense aid uh, offering to their client network? Yeah, so we, yes, so the answer is, practice, I guess. Yeah, we, we uh, it's been not a very long engagement with Deloitte. We've spoken to them about maybe eight months and I, they came to us. So that's really the, the way you want to engage with, with these. And, and they are bringing us to a much broader market as well. But where they took notice of us is when they really saw how we were consistently winning very, very high value, high quality mandates. And they came in, they looked at our product, they liked it, and they have made the investment to train their teams up uh, to be able to then sell and implement our products. So it's very exciting. Um, I don't want to put too much anticipation on, on what we will, will do, but in general, with these large consulting firms, they're only going to bring something on if they think that they can monetize and, and make something out of it. So, yeah, we're excited. We're just keeping calm. <laughs> no problem. Nick, uh, thank you very much for coming back and joining us. Uh, it's been a while since we've uh, got a got an update for you on, on all things uh, common. And, um, yeah, look forward to... Uh, keeping track of the story over, over the next couple of months. And hopefully we can get you back in maybe, uh, maybe when the full year res results come out, maybe s September time. Yeah, I think we'll look forward to that. It's going to be a nice one for us. We're okay. in a great quarter. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, thanks, Nick. Thanks, everyone. And uh, I hope everybody has a good rest of their Monday. Thank you. Cheers.